the topic of Olam Haba is really hinges on a, on a question the Torah promises us in several places reward for following the mitzvahs and, punish, and punishment for disobeying the mitzvahs. And it sounds like generally when the Torah describes it, it speaks about more this worldly benefits. It says, we'll see in the first source, that if you observe the commandments, so then your land will yield produce, they'll be plentiful, you'll live in security. We even say in the second uh, paragraph of Shema, speaking about uh, material prosperity. So it sounds like from the simple meaning of many verses in the Torah that reward and punishment happens in this world. Um, is evidenced by the by the first source in in Vayi, uh, in Parshas Bechukosa. It says, "Im Bechukosa is they lechu." If you'll go in my uh, in my paths, and if if you if you follow my statutes, that mitzvah side tishmoru, and you observe my commandments. So then, what does Hashem say? Vinasati kishmechem bi itam, and I'll give you your rain and your times. Not the eretz yivula, and the land will be plentiful, etc., etc. So it sounds like. Where does reward and punishment happen? Happens in this world. However, the Gemara in Kiddushin, in Source 2, quotes Rabbi Yaakov's statement. Rabbi Yaakov says, Damar schar mitzvah by Baha'i Alma leka. That Rabbi Yaakov says that there's no reward for performance of a mitzvah in this world. So it sounds, uh, here, here the this is only one place, but out of several places in the Torah, when it speaks about following mitzvahs, it sounds like it's, we are getting rewarded in this world. We'll have, uh, the land will yield produce, we'll have security against our enemies. It sure sounds like it's speaking about this world. The Gemara seems to make a sweeping statement that there's no reward for mitzvahs in this world. So, there are a couple ways to, to reconcile it, or at least understand the fact that the Torah is describing reward in this world, but it sounds like, on a, at a basic level, the primary reward, and seemingly punishment for that matter, is not experienced in this world, but is experienced, we'll call it, in the world to come, and we'll see what that is exactly. The Maharsha, one of the uh, commentaries on this Gemara, qualifies it. He says, in Source 3, but it all takes you... That don't challenge the statement, don't find the statement difficult from in light of all the states in the Torah that speak about reward for observance of mitzvot in this world. And if you listen to me, I'll bring about the, the, the blessings and the goodness um, and if not, so we'll bring a, Hashem speaks about uh, bringing um, about curses, that their enemies will oppress us, that uh, we'll be materially lacking, and that seems to be in this world. So how do we reconcile these passages in the Torah with Rabbi Yaakov's statement that there's no reward for a mitzvah in this world? So the Marsha says the Yeshlomar answer, the Rabbi Yaakov, the mode discuss her rabbim umasehem atovi mevim lahem kola brachus vatovo sinis guruba Torah, the gambo lam hazeh, the chain behefeh, the cheta rabbim. So he makes a distinction that the reward and punishment will be experienced collectively in this world, that on a communal level, if the Jewish people, or for that matter, we see from Noah, if mankind follows Hashem's ways, so in this world, Hashem will uh, give us bounty and Hashem will protect us from our enemies on a communal level. It seems like on a national level, we won't have these existential threats, both physically, um, materially. Um, however, the Marsha says, Aval, um, Rabbi Yaakov, lo amarkein ela ela biyachin. Rabbi Yaakov's statement that there's no reward for mitzvah in this world, that's speaking about on an individual level. That however we can understand that a person is not, as an individual, rewarded in this world for a mitzvah. At least not, uh, 
doesn't experience the primary reward. So it sounds like on an individual level, if we do a mitzvah, we do an act of chesed, um, we file the Torah. So maybe individually, really, the reward that we're going to get is going to be experienced in the next world. On a community level or even on a, on a global level, there will be um, rewards in this world as far as bounty, as far as protection from, from enemies. That happens, and, and that will be realized in this world from collectively following Hashem's ways. But on an individual level, according to Yaakov's statement in the Gemara, that uh, the primary reward, or really real reward, he says there's no reward for a mitzvah in this world, so the reward happens in the world to come, and we'll have to see what exactly the world to come is. Good so far? So the Rambam reinforces this concept that really the primary reward that we get for observance of a mitzvah is going to be in this world. So the Rambam says in, in Source 4, if you to the mitzvahs that were given, if we listen to Hashem, um, that really the mitzvahs that we um, are rewarded for will be experienced in, in the world to come. And the the ultimate punishment for um, the wicked is also experienced really in the afterlife that the, the according to the Rambam the really the worst punishment that someone can get is is, is car race is really having their soul cut off really not having any connect, connection any spirituality in the afterlife it's basically it's basically done um, but the Rambam recognizes that, that what does it mean when, the, when it's written in the Torah, if you listen, then you will receive X, and if you don't, you'll, you'll, uh, this will happen. It sounds like all of those things are in this world. So he says a very interesting thing. He says, Ein osen hatovos heim sof matan shel mitzvah. So the, these uh, that these things that the Torah promises us are not the end, the final consequence. Really, when the Torah says uh, it'll be, you'll be rewarded, you'll be punishment, you'll be punished, and when that refers to this world, so that, the Rambam says, is not the final consequence, the final reward, or the final punishment. Where does that happen? Um, he says, um, that rather, what is it? That if, when, when the Torah speaks about, uh, about uh, having, having bounty and uh, being protected from enemies and having a good life, so Ram is saying that that's not really the ultimate reward that the Torah is, is guaranteeing us. Rather, what's the benefit of um, Hashem sparing us? I Meaning, why does Hashem say that he'll spare us from, from famine, from war, etc.? He says, really, what's the reason? It's that, that, that that's really only a means to an end. That if we're spared from these types of um, negative situations, will be able to then more effectively earn our portion in the world to come. He says, That all the things that, um, uh, that Hashem uh, guarantees us uh, if, that, that, that we'll receive if we follow the Torah, all the silver, gold, uh, um, being being full, not 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 being hungry. That really, when the, when the Torah says that I'll give you material success, I'll protect you from your enemies, the Rambam is saying that's not really the reward for mitzvos. That's a mean. That's 
a means to allow you to do mitzvot. That if you follow the Torah, I'll take away external types of distractions, external types of situations that make it more difficult to follow the Torah. And there, thereby, you'll be able to occupy yourselves in Torah, the mitzvot, and earn reward in the world to come. Does that make sense? That really when the Torah says, um, it speaks of material rewards, that's saying, if you do this, I'll basically, it's a means to an end. Hashem is saying, I'll allow you to live in the conditions in which you'll be able to more effectively and more successfully earn your portion in the world to come. So that's what the Torah means when it, when it says that, but not that material affluence and the protection from our oppressors is the ultimate reward. The ultimate reward will not be experienced in this world, as Rabbi Yaakov said in the Gemara. Rather, it will be experienced in the world to come. And if we look at many um, earlier sources, they do, we'll see several that... Uh, emphasize the fact that there's a lot we don't know about the world to come, you know, because uh, Mari mentions that uh, no eye has seen it, right? Unless someone's been there and, and has been back. You know, no one can really, we have certain illusions and certain basic uh, ideas about it, but there is um, a lot that we don't know about it. And in Source 5, of Saudi Yagon, from the, from the Middle Ages. So he also acknowledges that the Tun Source 5, that the um, that which is mentioned in the Torah regarding reward is only about this world. Why does the Torah not, if as the Rambam says, and if as the Gemara says, that really the true reward is in the next world, so why does the Torah speak so much about reward in this world. The Torah almost exclusively speaks about reward in this world, except for some allusions here and there. So why does it emphasize so much this world if really the, the ultimate reward is in the next world? So he says, really, essentially the Torah is an instruction book for us here. The Torah tells us what we need to know about this world. That is essentially what the Torah is. Um, he says, one, we can't really grasp reward in the next world, so it may not be even a, a sufficient motivator. And two, really the Torah is, is telling us what we're supposed to do here. Um, and he's, as he mentioned, that the Torah specifically mentions the conquest of the land of Canaan of Eretz Yisrael, because that was what was going to happen. The Torah basically tells us is an instruction book for what we need to do in our lives and what in our world we'll experience either way. So even though the, the ultimate reward is not in this world, Rav Sadi Gon says that the, that the Torah didn't delve into um, describing or even emphasizing so much the world to come because it's not so... It's not so um, call it practical. It's not so, so imminent. And this is, this is also seen. Um, we, we, we just mentioned that really the Torah speaks about this world because practically uh, that's, that's what we're dealing with. That's, that's where we're living. Um, but the, the next source, the Gemara in Masech Zerovin, says that really what we do in this world is preparation for the next world. Um, the Gemara says, "Hainu the Amar of Yeshua ben Levi, Rishu ben Levi says, 'My Daksiva Sher Nochi Mitzavcha Yom La So Some that that which I shall keep the commandments which I command you today to do them, Hayom La So Some today to do them, Velo La Machar La So Some, and not that you won't you'll have the opportunity to do them today, and you won't have the opportunity to do them tomorrow, Hayom La So Some La Machar La Kabel Scharav." that today you do them, and tomorrow, basically, in the, in the world to come, you'll receive reward. So it sounds like the relationship of, of this world to the next world is, this world we do them, we don't necessarily receive reward in this world. In the next world, we can't do mitzvos, we can't have opportunity to, to build up a reward, but that's when we receive reward. 
So it seems from what we've seen so far that while there is a certain level of uh, maybe comfort that's given to us in this world, really our job in this world, the, the reward for, for what we do, and really it sounds like even the, to some extent the purpose of doing mitzvahs is to prepare for the, for the world to come. That when, when Hashem says that I command you to do them, that means do them now, do them where, where you're able to, to do them. But you can expect a reward, really, in, in the world to come. So the next part I want to take a look at is what, what is the world to come like? When we speak about the world to come, what are, what are we speaking about? And they're going to be, does it mean, because we, sometimes we, there, there are different terms that are sometimes used, used interchangeably, and the question is, are they meant to be used interchangeably? We speak about Gan Eden, right? That we, in Kelmale Rachel, we speak about souls that are in Gan Eden. We speak about Yemos HaMashiach, the days of Mashiach. Um, and we speak about Olam Haba. And sometimes they're, they're used um, interchangeably. The question is, are they interchangeable? And if not, how do we understand each one? So, the, we, we have sources um, from the Talmud that, that describe the next world, but the question will still be what stage in history are we speaking about? And, and then you'll see what I mean. Um, the, the Talmud in, in Brachos, source 7, says that lo kolam haolam haba, that this world is not like the next. The next world is, like, is not like this. Excuse me. Um, this world is not like the next world. Olam haba ein bo lo achila velo shasia velo piriribia. In olam haba, there's not eating, drinking, procreation, velo masu mata, and there's not business, velo kina, velo sina. There's not jealousy. There's not hatred, velo tachros nidoka competition. Rather, ella tzadikim yoshvin vaatro sehem barashehem benene meziva shchina. Rather, what will happen in Olam Haba, there won't be, it sounds like it's completely non-physical from what it's described, there won't be any types of physical involvement. Rather, what will happen, the uh, righteous will sit um, with, uh, with, with crowns on their head and will delight in the, um, in the radiance of the Shechina, the divine presence. So, it sounds like it's describing really not a physical world, an entirely spiritual world. And the commentaries explain what does it mean to, um, to be sitting with crowns on their head and benefiting from the radiance of the divine presence. It's um, understood by many to mean that uh, we'll have a greater knowledge of and closeness to Hashem. And that's supposed to be really equivalent, uh, greater than all of the pleasures uh, of this world. All the material pleasure, that, that, that pleasure of closest to Hashem and, and increased understanding, that's something that's understood to be greater than anything in this world. And, it's, and it sounds like from the Gemara, this is describing something that's completely spiritual. And we're going to see the question is, when is this speaking about? Is this after we die? Is this after the resurrection of the dead? So we'll, we'll get there in a little bit. But, but right now, we want to know what's the, what are some characteristics of the world to come. It sounds like there's a um, really lack of physicality and entirely spiritual uh, realm. However, we did mention that we haven't seen the world to come. And Source 8, the, the Gemara emphasizes this. He says, the prophets, when they prophesied, they really only talk, spoke about the days of Mashiach. So it sounds like we see in many of the prophets they speak about what will happen. The, we spoke about last week, the entire world will recognize Hashem. Um, so that's really about Yemosa Mashiach. But Olam Haba, Olam Haba, it says that no eye has, has seen it. Um, you know, so they, they, even the prophets weren't able to um, envision or, or, or tell us about it. And Shmuel says, he saw last week, that Shmuel says that he really compares Olamba and Yomosa Mashiach. So the question is, 
<coughs> are the days of Mashiach and Olam Var the necessarily the same thing, but we saw last week that at least in the days of Mashiach, according to Shmuel, and, really, and this is the opinion of the Rambam, that nothing will really change other than being uh, relieved of the persecution of the nat- nations of the world. Now we're going to, I want to focus in particular, this was historically a heated debate um, between the Rambam and the Ramban. And it was so much heated, we'll see the Raivid, some accused based on this, uh, someone, uh, some accused the Rambam of actually denying Trias Mason, the idea of the resurrection of the dead. He puts in his 13 principles of, of, of faith and um, he wrote a, a, a short book about it, but we'll see that some challenged the, um, the, the Rambam's explanation of the world to come. We'll see the, the explanation of the Rambam, of Maimonides, and then the Ramban, Nachmanides, how they understand basically these different things that we, that we mentioned. Gan Eden, Olam Haba, the times of Mashiach. Trias HaMesim, when, the, when the, the resurrection of the dead. You know, when does that all happen? You know, for right now, I, you know, we kind of think, hopefully it won't be so far in the future, but we think about the future, we'll see, but we, we have a lot of things. We talk about Mashiach comes, it's Chiesa Mesim. Is it before Mashiach comes? After, after Mashiach comes, where does Olam Haba uh, fit in? So these, these were things that, because we see from earlier sources, they were left somewhat unclear among the Rishonim, among uh, others, but in particular the Rambam and the Ramban have different explanations of how exactly this is all going to play out. So the in source 10 basically reiterates that the Rambam says that really the um, good that is hidden for the righteous will happen in, in the world to come. And uh, he says that this won't, this, uh, you know, this world won't be um, accompanied by death. There will be some sort of everlasting life, and that's ultimately where the righteous will be rewarded. So, he, if you look at, at Source 11, how does he describe Olam Haba? Very similar to what the Gemara says. He says, Olam Haba ain't bo guf, uh, there's no body or physical form. It's only a, seemingly a world of souls, the souls of the, of the righteous people, below guf, without a body like angels. I don't know if it's really a, like a Jewish perception, but there's a, right, don't, isn't there some believe that when, you're, when you die, you become an angel. So I don't know if it's necessarily speaking about that, but it sounds like in Olam Haba, that that's, and we'll see when that takes place, um, there will be an entirely spiritual existence like that of an angel. There won't be eating and drinking. There won't be anything that they're physical, um, anything physical, and, and there won't be, and people won't have any physical needs. Rather, tzaddikim, the righteous will sit with crowns on their heads and will, and will uh, delight in the radiance of the divine presence. And what does that mean, that they'll delight in the radiance of the divine presence? So, And will possess the knowledge that they grasp which allow them to merit the life of the world to come. The olam haba that we're speaking about is something that's that's not physical, and as a result of living in this non-physical, entirely spiritual realm, he says sheyodin umasigin mamitas hakadosh baruch They'll they'll know and they'll be able to comprehend grasp the truth of of Hashem. Masheinam yodin vehem beguf faafel ashafel. And they'll be able to have a greater comprehension of Hashem and of the truth beyond what they were able to have in this world, because this world we're limited by by certain physicality. We don't have that direct, uh, you know, line of, of communication with with the divine. 
but they are, for, as a, the ultimate reward for those who are righteous in this world, they'll be able to have this uh, in the entirely spiritual, pleasurable existence. Ah, so, so Stephen said, um, when does Mashiach fit in this? When does Tchiasa Mesim fit into this, the resurrection of the, of the dead? So the, the Rambam says here, Source 12, all of the beneficence with the, which the prophets uh, promised Israel, as similar to what the Gemara says, that the prophets only talk about Mimos Mashiach, that what happens when Mashiach comes, that the um, dominion over the world will return to to Eretz Yisrael, that the Jews will have be relieved from persecution. That's the days of, of Mashiach, says the Rambam. Aval tovas chayolam haba, ein la erek v'dimyon, it doesn't have any uh, measurement or comparison. Lo demu in the v'yim k'day shelo yivuzu osa b'dimyon. That olam haba, he says, is not the same as the days of Mashiach. The days of Mashiach, the Rambam says, and we saw this uh, at greater length last week, is going to be, in the Rambam's vision, is going to be everyone will recognize Hashem and will be relieved from, from persecution. But, Olam Haba, he says that will, that's not necessarily the same as, as, the, as, as the days of, of Mashiach. So, The, the Ravid, who frequently argues on the Rambam, he claimed or expressed concern that the Rambam somehow denied the idea of Tchiyas HaMesim. Because isn't the idea of Tchiyas HaMesim that you come back to life and you live in this world? That the dead come back, the dead whose souls have separated from their bodies, when presumably resurrection is that sounds very Christian, but whatever res- resurrection is when the soul is then reunited with the body. But here the Rabbim is saying that the ultimate destination is when there's no body. So the the Ravid challenge in source thirteen, he says, "Devara Isha Zed." The words of this man. Uh, it's the Ravid's challenge that the Rambam is perhaps suggesting there's no resurrection of the dead of the physical body. Maybe saying there's only a, a um, continuation or revival of the souls. He says, um, so he says it could be that they could come in some sort of, um, you know, physical um, existence or some sort of physical existence, but that's, uh, you know, very spiritual. But the, um, but the, the, the Raiva takes some issue with the fact that the Rambam is speaking about Olam Haba in an entirely non-physical way, because how do we account for Tchiyas HaMesim? So, what the Rambam, I, I didn't put it on uh, well, here, they should have, um, but basically the Rambam, um, we'll see from the next source, but he, he holds that the, that the series of, of, of events will be as follows, that right now, as is, you see in, in source 14, that Olam Haba exists. Right now there's Olam Haba. And don't think that it'll be something that's new that's created in the future. Right now, there is Olam Haba. What, and that's an entirely non-physical world. Then, when Mashiach comes, and when there's Tchiyas HaMesim, when there's a resurrection of the dead, so those souls that are in Olam Haba will now be returned to their bodies, 
and the Rambam says that they'll live very long lives, and they'll be able to earn more reward to then go back and you know live in Olam Haba forever. The, the, the Rambam isn't making any distinction there, but I guess where, wherever it is, we'll see that maybe now they're in Gan Eden, a, a sort of a world of souls, according to the Ramban. But I guess the idea is wherever they are, because as we saw, they can't, they no longer will have the opportunity to earn any merit for themselves, there's an idea that perhaps things that people do, particularly that children do, are able to um, raise their, their, their standing in the, in the world to come. So the idea is through, let's say, the mitzvahs that are done down here. And a yurt site, you try to do certain mitzvahs, you know, to merit the, the neshama. So the idea is that through there, the neshama should be able to, you know, raise where it is, so to speak, in, in we'll say, e- either the world to come or, or Ganeda. According to the Rambam, it would seem to be the world to come. But that's the idea, that we can't, because they can't do anything now, so we can perhaps benefit them by doing mitzvah, particularly children for parents, um, can benefit them um, when the, when they're in when they're in the next world. But that's basically according to, to the Ram. That right now, when when people uh, pass away, if they're righteous, they go to Olam Haba, where there's no physical, um, where where where, where there's, there's no physicality. Then they. Um, Metchias and Mason, they'll come back. The righteous will live very long lives, and then they'll seemingly go back to uh, this eternal world. Um, the the again, the the Riva takes issue in in source fifteen that um, he says that the basically Olam Haba will be a uh, you know, creation in the future. The idea that this world is uh, around for 6,000 years, um, the question how to, how to understand that, but um, the right it ba- is basically argues on the fact that when we sp- when the understand, you know, the sages speaking about Olam Haba, this type of non-physical world, that that's something that exists now. Others understand that that, that, that ultimate uh, Call it destination will be created in the future, and rather what exists now. So the Ramban, the Ramban has really a different order of events. Right? We said the Rambam says that when you die now, and assuming you're a righteous person, so you go to Olam Haba. Then there's the days of Mashiach, the Chiyas and Mason. They come back, and then they go back. The Ramban has a different order of events. He says, um, Surah 16, Hishar hanefashos v'kiyumam ba'olam hanashamos nikolar b'senu gan eden. So when we speak about the reward for, even go back, going back to one of the earlier sources, the Gemara that says that there's no reward for a mitzvah in this world, so he's saying, so what is that referring to? Where does one get reward? Where, where are the souls now? He says, in the olam hanashamos, in the soul world. And he says, Nikola Rabbosenu Gan Eden. And that's also what we refer to as Gan Eden. That right now, when righteous people die, so they go to Gan Eden slash Olam Haneshamo, the soul world. But he says, Akhre Kain Yavo Yemeha Mashiach. And after some time, hopefully soon, Mashiach will come. Fumi Klal Olam Hazet. And uh, the messianic era will be in this world. Uva Sofan Yehe Yom Hadin Vitchias Hamesim. It's really towards the end of the messianic age. Um, there will be a day of judgment, and the those who are in the Olam Haneshamos now will be will be brought down. Because amazing, Shuaschar Hakola Hagufa Nefesh, and then what will happen? Those who are in Gan Eden or slash the Olam Haneshamos will then come down and will be reunited with their bodies. And there will be this, call it hybrid of spiritual and physical, meaning we'll have a, th- that really Olam Haba, and that's Olam Haba. It's really, Olam Haba is somewhat of a, has a physical aspect to it. Just, just again, so that when, so now when someone dies, they go to the Olam HaNeshamos. They're there. Then Mashiach comes. Tchias Hamesim is then those souls come down, are reunited with the body, and then 
sort of the eternal world is the body and soul together in this physical but elevated world. And actually um, touches on somewhat of an interesting uh, uh, perspective, a question about the idea of, it sounds like according to the Ramban, there's an idea that the physical, that even within our physical bodies, we can be elevated to such an extent that we're living an entirely you know, godly existence. That's an idea that we you know, see in, in some other places that, that a, in particularly righteous people, there's less of a tension between the physical and the spiritual, that we sanctify the spiritual. So it sounds like the, the Ramban is saying that the final result will be not a total separation of the, of the physical and the spiritual, but the physical will be able to be so uplifted, and that will be the ultimate uh, you know, world to come that was promised in, you know, the, in, in the Torah that the Gemara says is really what's reserved for the righteous. So what about Gehenna? Right? We don't like to, to say it, but what, what, is, what is Gehenna? The truth is, there are, it's not so clear. Some sources seem to indicate that it's um, you know, literally a hot place, maybe even a place in this world. Um, it could be some, some event. Um, and there's an idea that's probably the, mo- the um, more common understanding is that it's a sort of uh, purgatory. And this is how the uh, Ramchal in Derech Hashem, Rav Moshe Chaim Lutzato, in 17 understands it. He says, basically, um, as we mentioned, the reward for, for reward and punishment happens you know, in, in the next world. Um, and if you get reward, you know, you really want reward because that's, you know, that, that'll be permanent and, and punishment, obviously, you want to avoid. So, but, you know, m- most people aren't perfect. You know, and, and um, probably even if, you know, we, had, we live good lives at the end of our lives, maybe we, we haven't lived our life in such a way that we'd be able to really earn the, the ultimate reward, or we'd still have you know, some things that we need to uh, be held accountable for. So what does uh, Gehenna do? So the Ramchal explained, based on, based on others, that um, it's like a, a purgatory, that there's a certain amount of punishment, a certain amount of suffering that one will, that one will have in order to then cleanse themselves to be able to actually get the reward in the world to come, or to get eternal reward. The, the Ramchal really takes the approach of the, more or less of the Ramban, who says that there's this world of souls, and there's Tchiyas Mesim, and then there's Olam Haba. But, but either way, even in, the, let's say, the Olam HaNeshamot, in the world of souls itself, so there will be a, a purification process, a, a experience of Gehenim, and through that, a person will be able to you know, cleanse themselves, purge themselves of, of things that are preventing them from having the ultimate spiritual, spiritual reward, and then they'll be able to experience it. And he says that there are some people who are so evil that they, will, that they won't have the opportunity to have any reward in the world to come. And for that, even you know, Gehenna won't help them out. Um, but he says that that number is a, is a minority. Most people are able to um, atone for their sins and, and be able to then let, be allowed to receive reward through this experience of, of Gehenna, except for you know, certain people who are particularly evil. And the, the Mishnah in the Sech Sanhedrin speaks about certain famous individuals who have no share in the world to come. So you have, um, has a has a has a list there, but uh, but we have the another thing we have the mission that says that all Jews have a portion in the world to come, um, and the mission there says all Jews except for you know a couple of people who don't, but um, it basically and as you can see from the Derech Hashem that most people will have the opportunity to uh, you know to, to receive reward in the next world. And we have an interesting, in Pirkei Avos, we have an interesting relationship or perspective on this world as opposed to the world to come. 
the the mission says source eighteen or Yaakov Omer Olam Hazed Doma Leprosdor Bifnei Olam Haba that this world is comparable to uh, an antechamber before the the world to come. Haskin Atzma Kol Leprosdor Kadei Shadikanos Letrakla Letrakla that. Um, prepare yourself while you're in the antechamber so that you can en- enter the banquet hall. So he says, on the other hand, while this world is a, the antechamber and the ultimate banquet hall, which we're in this world to prepare for, that's the, the world to come. That's where, that's where the ultimate reward is. Um, however he says Yafesh that, that one moment of repentance and good deeds in this world is greater than um, all of the, the life in, in the next world however and greater is a single moment of bliss in Olam Haba greater than all of the pleasures of this world so how do we understand this so I think that when it says greater is one hour, one moment of, of good deeds and repentance in this world and all of the good in the next world, that's really because this is our only opportunity to, to do mitzvot are in this world. So in the next world, we'll really be lacking the opportunity to, to grow and to improve ourselves. So in that sense, this world is greater. We only have an opportunity. Here we can actually make a decision to, to serve Hashem. It's a real, it's a real investment uh, that we, we, can, we can really grow. However, one moment of bliss in the world to come is, um, is, is greater than all of the pleasures in this world. So you say this world, we're really preparing for the next world. And through doing that, it's, it's tremendous. It's not just... I, I think what this, what this Mishnah is coming to, to tell us is don't think that this world is something that's you know, meaningless. Oh, we just need to get to the next world. No, this world is very important. That this world is really where we get to and have the opportunity to build ourselves up and to serve Hashem and to overcome challenges. That that's really, really very important. But where we'll experience the ultimate bliss is in the world to come. So wherever that may be, whether it's uh, something that we would experience right after death, and then we'll go back, and then after Tchias Amesim, we'll we'll then we'll then go back to, um, or there's this Olam and the Shamot, and then and then the existence in the Messianic times. Either way, um, as the uh, as our sages have pointed out, no eye has has seen it. There's not much that we, that we know about it, but we do know that. This world is not the the final destination, and therefore, I think that should um, you know help us resist the the urge to um, you know enjoy or necessarily indulge in the in the physicality in this world, and then to focus on on uh, temporal things. While comfort and even some luxuries are good, ultimately. You know, they're not things that you know we're able to to take with us. The real value is um, you know our Torah and mitzvot and things that we that we can can take with us to the next world. And we may be lacking something in this world, but this world is uh, ultimately not not so important. So I think in that sense, it gives us perspective that any types of um, we'll give call reward and punishment, benefits, wealth, things like that, or, or challenges in this world are really not. The ultimate, let, ultimate, and that if we do do mitzvahs, we'll be rewarded in in this world. Even if we may not see it, we'll be rewarded in the next world. Even if we may not not see it in this world, and you know there are many different uh, sources that speak about the fact that we should um, load up on on currency that we can spend in the next world, like Torah and mitzvahs and and Build acts of chesed. Building my neman. There's a, a story where someone uh, comes to the Chavetz Chaim, uh, and she sees his house, and you know he's a world. He's a, he was already old. He already published uh, many books, and this person comes and sees that he's living. He doesn't even have a floor. Uh, he says, "Where's your where's your furniture?" 
Uh, so the Chavetz Chaim says, well, where's, where's your furniture? He says, I don't have furniture with me. I'm just you know, passing through here. So he says, I'm also passing through this world. That I could, uh, there's no point in buying you know, fancy furniture. I can't take that with me. Um, and the only thing we can take with us is uh, Torah and mitzvot. Recently, in another story, I think that the Chavetz Chaim would tell that um, it, as there's a story of a person who went to a foreign country. And in that country, uh, diamonds and jewels and pearls were very, were very cheap. Um, and it was expensive, uh, food was very expensive. So this person there, he, okay, he thought food's very, you know, very expensive, you know, for, I'll pay $1,000 for a loaf of bread, you know, I'll go back to where I'm from and I'll bring it back, and wow, I'm bringing back a lot of stuff. Then he, then he comes back and, you know, he has a long voyage and he, you know, goes into his pocket and the, the food is rotten. He's like, why did I spend all my money on, on, the, on, on a slice of bread? Where I am, it's not, it's not so expensive. Um, and then he goes, he's, he's really disappointed. And he reaches into his pocket and he sees that he has one of the, the diamonds. And, and through this, he's able to, to get very wealthy. It's worked a lot where, where he is. But he is, then becomes very disappointed and is thinking, imagine if I really spent time loading up on you know, the diamonds and the pearls and you know, instead I invested in something that's not so valuable where I'm from. So I think that's, that's like really you know, Torah and, and, and Mitzvah. So those are the, the currency that when we go to the next world, we'll be able, we'll be able to spend you know, and, not, and not other things. So a bit of a perspective, and uh, we should have you know, many years in this world and also merit uh, in the coming of Mashiach to get some Mason and Alam Haba. Amen. Amen.